So this lecture is on the Archer hardware, and over your introduction, um, slides were developed by EPCC, but quite a few slides, um, a lot of the detailed architectural slides were contributed by Cray, so thanks to them for, for providing that material. It's our standard license, non-commercial share alike, Creative Commons. So I'm actually going to go through these slides relatively quickly. There's quite a lot of information on these, um, which you can review later, but I'm, I want to cover the, um, the, the the really important points here. Um, so Archer is built from a bunch of nodes. It's a massively parallel processor, an MPP system, but it's built from a large number of nodes. And each of these nodes is a, a small shared memory computer. And as we've seen um, from the overview lecture, uh, the back-end nodes have um, 24 cores, uh, Intel uh, processor cores in a single shared memory node. There are actually two basic types of nodes on, on any Cray XC30, and Archer is no exception. The compute nodes are often called the back-end. This is a large uh, array of, of, of nodes that do the large parallel jobs. But we also have service or login nodes, and the ones you'll come across most notably are the front-end nodes. You just log in to SSH and to login.archer.ac.uk. And it, they provide all the normal things you'd expect. You can on the login nodes, you can log in and perform interactive tasks and compile and such like. There are other service uh, nodes which do things. Uh, there are magic uh, things called mom nodes which help with your PBS job. There's other nodes to do with routing and the file system. But the the um, the service nodes you'll come across most um, commonly are the um, the login nodes, which we call the front end, and the other nodes um, are the compute nodes, and we, we typically call them the back end. And you typically have a lot more compute nodes than service nodes. Differences between them, as you said, the the service or login nodes you log into them, they run a full version of Linux. Um, so it will be a very uh, familiar environment to you if you've used Linux before. You edit, compile, and do other interactive tasks there. They're shared between users, so um, there are, there's more than one login node, but when you log in, you'll be allocated to a particular one, and you'll be sharing it with other users. Um, and there's other service nodes as well, um, which can be used for various system services, but the most important ones to a user are the login nodes. Once you've created your job, we you submit it for execution on the compute nodes, and we'll see how that works later. These are where your production jobs are executed. They also run Linux, but they run a, a, a version of Linux called Compute Node Linux, which is produced by Cray. And it's very much a stripped-down version of Linux, optimized for these big batch workloads. For example, you know, you're not going to be running graphical interfaces or, or and such uh, graphical programs on the, on the back-end node, so it's stripped down for, for large parallel jobs. The interface from your login node to the compute node is through a batch system, or like on most HPC, like on most HPC systems, and on Arch, we use something called PBS Pro. And importantly, the uh, the compute nodes are allocated exclusively. In other words, you're allocated an entire node or multiple nodes for the duration of your job, and you will not share them with other users, and that's quite important. It means you have full access to all the, the CPU cores and all the memory. You don't need to worry about interacting with other users. So that makes job runtime and, and, um, and performance more reproducible. There's a lot more compute nodes than login nodes. So in Archer, we'll see there's a word of 5,000 compute nodes and maybe a, a 10 or so um, login nodes. So the layout, how is Archer actually laid out? This is quite interesting. The basic building block is this compute node, and this is a single um, Linux o um, operating system um, running on this on each node. The node has got 24 cores, but physically it's made of two Intel processors. Um, so on the, on the actual board, there will be two sockets. So we have two processors plugged in. Each of them has 12 cores. So it's a fairly standard Intel 12 core processor. And um, if you're familiar with this, it forms two NUMA regions, non-uniform memory access regions. So uh, each um, processor, the 12 cores on a processor, can access their own memory um, more uh, more quickly than they can access the memory on another uh, socket. Although to the user, it does appear as a single 24-core um, shared memory node. There is some structure underneath it. There's memory. Typically, we have 64 gigabytes per node. Um, some of them have some some nodes have more than that. And there is a connection to the Ares um, network, um, one per per node. So each node has its own um, route, its own gateway into the into the Ares network. 
terminology, as I said, a node is a single Linux uh, operating system. It has two of these sockets. All cores see the same shared memory space, although with somewhat different um, access speeds depending on which of the, the sockets you're in. But to first, I mean, the, the, to basic um, assumption is that Archer comprises a large number, almost 5,024 core shared memory systems. Uh, so if you're familiar with this, the maximum extent of an OpenMP shared memory program is 24 cores because an OpenMP program can't run across multiple operating systems. And we have a single shared memory operating system up to 24 cores. Now that packaging into compute nodes is visible to the user. For example, we'll see when you request resources in Archer, you ask for a certain number of nodes and you're given exclusive access to all the cores on a node. Now, there is a higher level structure, the packaging of Archer. These nodes are, are packaged into blades, and there's, there's a level of thing called a chassis and a thing called a group. They're not explicitly visible, but we'll cover in the next few slides how that works because they may have it performance impacts in practice. But it's useful to understand the hierarchy. And this diagram shows you how the, um, the nodes are compute are uh, put together on a blade. A blade is a, a thing you you pull in and out of a, a compute rack. Uh, and on Archer, we have four uh, compute nodes per blade. That is actually uh, eight processors, as we've seen. And the important point about these is that the uh, there's one um, of these uh, network routing chips, these Cray Aries routing chips. So so a compute blade attaches to a to a single Cray routing chip and there are um four nodes, eight processors um per per blade. So there's one one of these Aries routers and we have uh, quite a high um um interconnect uh, quite a high um speed attached to them and there's other other details here but it's really the, the conceptual level I'm interested in here so we'll see that actually the, um, the, the there's a bandwidth of 14 gigabits per second um, off one of these, these these routers okay so the real important thing is that the building blocks we've seen that we have a blade which has made a four computer as you'll see that's a physical thing which you can pull in and out the next level is a chassis, so all the uh, blades in a chassis are very tightly connected with each other, and there's actually 16 compute blades form a chassis, which is 64 compute nodes, um, which is 64 times 24 compute cores. The next level up is a group. What we do is we take um, three of these chassis and put them into a, a single cabinet, which is a single thing you can you can wheel around, um, and two of those cabinets are connected together into a group. So that's 384 compute nodes form a two cabinet group. That's again quite tightly interconnected. The next level, which is connected by something called the rank three network, which is actually um, an optical network, um, is the highest level. And we'll see how that, that's cabled together. But on Archer, we have 12 groups, which makes our 4,920 compute nodes. So on Archer, um, we have 12 groups or, or 24 cabinets each of which has um, um, each cat well each group has 384 compute nodes so the important thing is how these are connected together by the network they're not standalone systems that they're, they're, they're tied together with the the XC30 network which has got something called a dragonfly topology which is quite quite complicated quite heavily interconnected and we'll have a, have a diagrammatic representation of it here so just a, a bunch of, of, of stats. I mean, in principle, the, the network scales to over half a million cores. We have a few hundred thousand. It's optimized for quite short uh, transfers. And in fact, a lot of HPC codes do a large number of, of small message transfers. And that, that's something which the network is good at. Um, it um, it has a very high bandwidth in some so for example uh, you actually can't saturate the bandwidth from a single from a, a single node there's enough bandwidth on the on the network to um, to actually accommodate um, shared use because you'll see we actually do share the network at some level with other users and um, it's quite a fault tolerant design you, the user doesn't see faults in the sense that if the, if an error happens then it's retried and there's adaptive routed round failed links so it's a very reliable reliable system 
So here's a picture of the network. This is a single um, chassis with 16 compute blades, and you'll see that within that, um, these um, these eight, these 16 compute blades, which is 64. Uh, uh, process, uh, 64 nodes are, ve are very closely connected. There's an ev every um, um, uh, node is connected to every other, um, every blade is connected to every other blade. So there's a lot of uh, networking there. So we've got an example here that if, if, if a, a processor on a particular blade called, say, slot 3 wants to access another blade, uh, say on slot 11, there's obviously a direct connection there, but we can see there's a lot of other uh, network connectivity there, and the network is able to use that. So although um, there's a direct connection between the two, um, the network will also use indirect connections as well. It will use adaptive routing, so that increases your bandwidth between... If you're doing point-to-point -point communication, this gives you a very high bandwidth because you don't necessarily take the direct route, you take other routes as well. And it's adaptive as well. So you can see that someone's spent quite a bit of time on this on this diagram. That you know the the packets of data between any two um, any two nodes to any two of these blades can take uh, a lot of different routes, and that that increases your 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 network bandwidth. The next level is what connects um, um, a, a chassis. As we saw, there were six. Um, I'll just say that there are three. Um, uh, chassis in a single um, a cabinet and two cabinets in a group. So a two cabinet group, which is 768 um, uh, individual um, Intel processors, 384 individual nodes, are very tightly connected through this, this copper interconnect. And it's a lot of connections there. So there's a, there's a direct, there's a lot of connections between the um, the Aries chips. And as we've seen before, each Aries chip, um, which is a which is a blade, uh, is one per blade connects to four of these of the nodes. So um, that's how it works. So that's our building block, very tightly interconnection of a single group, which I said is two um, two cabinets six chassis. Um, above that, we go to an optical network. So this was an electrical network previously, now we've got to an optical network. And that means that there is a different characteristics of, of connectivity when you go between um, different groups as opposed to within a group. And uh, well, you can actually tune the, the, the bandwidth here by, by paying more for, for optical cables if you want. And so this is a picture. You'll see that the optical cables are fairly standard uh, things that run above the um, run above the system. And as you see on Archer, um, we have 12 groups, 24 cameras, all connected by an optical network. And it's the same, it's the same um, statement for the optical network as for the electrical network, that although there's a direct uh, route between different groups, um, the, the system will bounce off other groups if that becomes congested. So that means that um, um, you can you can get sort of um, very good um, connectivity from different groups because you can use multiple connections between them. And that helps avoid congestion as well. So that's really just a, um, uh, an overview. And I think I'll go back through the details, but I think the most important slide is this slide here, um, where you just see the way that the system is layered up here, that we have blades into chassis, into groups, and then multiple groups are connected through this optical network. And that's quite a nice, useful um, uh, useful uh, diagram there. So any any CREA XC30 system will be like this. The number that would change is in this final column that you may have more or less groups. On Archer, we have 12 groups, 24 cabinets. Other systems may have more or less of these groups, but the, 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 the first three levels of the compute blade, the chassis, and the group will be the same for every uh, every uh, every Cray XC30 system. So I'll now I'll whiz through these slides to get back to where we were before. File systems in Archer, uh, we have a home file system, which is where you do your day-to-day -day work. Um, it's standard network NFS um, file system. It's not accessible on the compute nodes, and we'll come back to what the ramifications are of that later. Are, are later, but it is backed up, and so you should use it for source code and critical files. Slash work is a parallel file system which uses something called Lustre. It's accessible on all the nodes, both the compute nodes and the um, 
and the and the login nodes it's a very high performance parallel file system it's not backed up however but it is very large it's really too large to back up four petabytes um, the RDF, the Research Data Facility, um, is another file system. It's very large. It actually uses the IBM GPFS network, uh, GPFS file system. It's not accessible on the compute nodes, but the model is that you would keep critical files and compile and such like in slash home. You do your large production runs in slash work and produce any files there. And then if you have files and any post-processing and analysis, if you have files you do want to keep for longer term storage, you would move them to the RDF. Um, just another quick um, statement about file systems. There's no slash tep on the back-end nodes. The back-end nodes are diskless. So you just sometimes have to be careful if you're assuming there is a slash temp file system. There isn't one. All users are assigned to a project. I'll use Y14 as an example. That's our training project. And all the file systems are based around projects. So for example, if you logged in with the training account, which is in Y14, which is a guest account, you'd be in slash home slash Y14 slash Y14 slash uh, guest 01, for example, and you automatically have a, a similar structure on the slash work uh, system slash work slash y14 slash y14 slash guest 01. Group permissions are done per project, so in this case there'd be a y14 group. So to share data within projects, there are um, there's a shared directory created uh, slash say it would be for y14 it would be slash work slash y14 slash y14 slash shared slash home slash y14 slash y14 slash shared that has common group um, permissions for all of y14 so you can share um, data within a project within your collaborators in the y14 project at that level if you want to share data between projects you want group access uh, Unix group access outside of your project you would use slash work slash y14 slash shared and slash home slash y14 slash shared so you can decide to keep data private yourself share it with other users within your project or uh, in other users with, with, uh, in different projects and that's through these special shared um, the, the permissions have been set appropriately on these on these shared directories at these different levels and they exist on both slash work and slash home just a summary there, each node contains 24 Intel Ivory Bridge cores. There's almost 5,000, 4,920 compute nodes connected by this area's network. Most of the nodes have um, 64 gigabytes, but one of the groups, that's the 12th of the nodes, have 128. And we can select them if you need that. We'll see how to do that later. There's something over 118,000 cores, 300 terabytes of memory. And the peak performance of Arch is just over 2.5 petaflops. So as well as the, I mean, the hardware, it's nice to know about the hardware, but as a user, you're largely insulated from that. You're really interacting with the software. So we'll give a brief overview of the, the software stack on Archer. Here's a picture showing the whole um, the whole um, set of software. But we'll, again, I'll go through this relatively quickly, but I'll pick out the salient points in the next few slides. That's just a fairly complete listing. Um, the most important thing about parallel programming is, is that you need to communicate between different processors and the standard way of doing that is with MPI the message passing interface and um, to make uh, the best use of the of the Cray Aries network Cray provide an optimized um, standard but optimized version of MPI it's based on MPI CH2 which is a standard open source release but it's been tweaked for collectives and, and, and various um, IO optimizations and things which are specific to the Cray Aries network there is full MPI2 support except for the, the feature of dynamic process management which, which isn't, isn't typically used on on um, very high-end computers. It allows you to, in principle, shrink and grow your MPI uh, program during its runtime, but that's not something which really fits onto the model of the way we run large supercomputers. MPI3 support is, is, is on its way. Cray provide a performance analysis tool. We run this documentation on this, and we, have, we, we provide some courses on this, and it allows you to um, quite easily run profiling on your codes and uh, understand where your code is spending its time. So um, there's a way of doing automatic program instrumentation, automatic analysis. So it's quite easy to use Craypat to, um, um, to, to to profile your code and very quickly get a good idea of where it's spending its time and, and get an idea of whether it's doing it efficiently or not. So again, you should look up the documentation of that um, for the details. 
Um, again, Cray provides support for efficient debugging. Um, if a parallel program crashes, it's quite a problem because you can have thousands of MPI processes all crashing at once. And so there are various tools here, STAT and ATP, that Cray provide to allow you to um, allow users to see that more clearly. Um, there is traditional, well, traditional debugging. They have GDB. GDB, the GNU debugger, but what we'd recommend for large-scale parallel debugging is, is the linear uh, DDT distributed debugging tool, which gives you a graphical interface uh, uh, to debugging, but is, is very heavily designed for large parallel programs, so it doesn't um, it can it can cope with debugging thousands of processes at once in a single graphical interface and prov providing good summary information to the user. So if you do if you are having um, problems with your code and you want to debug it, definitely um, you should look up the documentation on the linear DDT. All user administration is done through the safe. Uh, this is our website, and every uh, user will have a. a an account on the safe. This is where you applied for your account. If you're a project uh, principal investigator, you're managing a project, you can manage project resources, you can get report on usage, you can also view your queries. So this is our really the for all user administration, it's all done through the safe. So um, you will have an account on that. It's worth logging on and, and looking at the, the functionality that's available to you there. So that's the end of this initial uh, this brief talk covering the, the hardware and software environment of, of Archer. The next talk will cover how to use it, really how to compile and submit and run jobs on Archer.